that is. Okay, uh, the, the webinar series is organized by two institutions. On the one side, the Young Scholars Initiative, YSI. Uh, four YSI working groups organized this event, the Latin America, Complexity Economics, States and Markets, and Economics of Innovation. On the other side, uh, the Center for Studies on Economics and Development, CED, for its Spanish initials, from the National University of San Martin uh, in Argentina. Uh, my name is Lorenzo Cassini. I'm a PhD fellow at CED, and, uh, and I'm also an, an organizer of the Complexity Economics Working Group, and I'll be the moderator of this session. Uh, the topic of the session is what to do in face of the new paradigm, Industri industrial policies for developing countries in times of industry 4.0. We are very grateful for the free presenters that are sharing this session. Let me introduce the speaker of today. I'll introduce uh, Fiona Tregena first. Fiona holds the South African Research Chair in Industrial Development, and she is a professor of economics at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, she's a part-time member of the Competition Tribunal, where she adjudicates competition cases, and she has served a number of boards, advisory panels, and councils. Uh, there, this includes the Presidential Economic Advisory Council, where she advises President Cyril Ramaphosa on economic policy. Her primary research focus is on issues of structural change, the industrialization, and industrial development, uh, her research has been published in journals including Review of Political Economy and Cambridge Journal of Economics. Our second presenter is Antonio Andrioni. Antonio is as Associate Professor of Industrial Economics at University College London, UCL, and Head of Research at the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. He's also visiting Associate Professor in the Fourth Industrial Revolution at the South African Research Chair in industrial development, University of Johannesburg, and he's editor of the European Journal of Development Research. Antonio has research, researched in and published extensively on production, technological change, and innovation dynamics, structural change, global value change, and industrial development, financialization and corruption, and governance and political economy of industrial policy. His work appeared in many important journals, such as the Cambridge Journal of Economics and Offer of Review of Economic Policy. And the third presenter is Veronica Robert. Veronica is researcher at the National Scientific and Technological Research Council, Argentina, and professor at the National University of San Martin and the National University of General Sarmiento. She is secretary of research of the Interdisciplinary School of High Social Studies of the National University of San Martin and director of the CED. Her primary research focus is on issues of innovation, technological change, and economic development. Her research has been published in journals including Structural Change and Economic Dynamics and Economics of Innovation and New Technologies. Uh, so let me tell you the session flow. Each presenter has about 20 minutes to present. After the free presentations, we have time for Q&A. So everybody, please feel free to prepare your questions. If you want to ask a question, can, you can tell me so in the chat, or you can also write a question in the chat and I'll read it. Uh, we are recording this session and the recording will be available on, on the YSI YouTube channel. There, you can also find the recordings of the two previous sessions of, the, of this webinar. If someone prefers not to be recorded, please turn the camera off and rename your YouTube user. Uh, so we will move to the presentation now. I'd like to invite uh, Fiona to make her presentation. So Fiona, please. Uh, thanks, uh, Lorenzo, and uh, thank you to the, the organizers. I'm really delighted uh, to be here. Um, greetings to everyone. Uh, good afternoon to those who are in the same time zone as me. Good morning to those in, in Latin America. Um, and a special thanks to the organizers as, as well for accommodating me in, in today's session. I was originally going to be in the, um, in the second panel, but had a, an unavoidable clash. Um, so ha happy that uh, 
I could be fitted in, in today uh, with, with, with uh, uh, friends and colleagues who are also speaking here. Um, and I've uh, shifted a bit the focus of, of my presentation to, to fit in with the, um, the topic for, for today. Um, I hope everyone can see the slides um, and, and give it a bit of a, a stronger uh, policy angle. Um, so I thought uh, it, it might be uh, worthwhile maybe just kicking off uh, briefly with outlining kind of a structuralist perspective on uh, issues of technological upgrading capabilities and so on. Um, probably something which is uh, very familiar to, to uh, most of us here, but I thought it would be useful in the sense of approaching issues of uh, 4 r um, recognizing that yes, some things are new, but also approaching it from uh, an existing perspective and uh, in terms of what is important and so on. Um, then you're briefly commenting on kind of what's new and, and distinctive in the 4 r um, Also just comment briefly on um, employment issues um, and then try and think through a bit about what is specific to the developing country context. Um, and then uh, talk about a thing about uh, policy, which I guess is, is the main focus for, for today. So yeah, just quite uh, quite briefly, um, you know, for approaching kind of issues of technological intensity and upgrading from a, a broad uh, structuralist perspective, I think recognizes the importance of um, technological intensity and, and upgrading for, for industrialization, for structural change, for, for catching up, uh, uh, the kind of traditional concerns of a, of a structuralist perspective. Um, and in some ways, innovation um, and uh, technological upgrading can be seen as, as part of the micro foundations of structural transformation. Um, so we need to recognize the importance of, of um, competitiveness, of capabilities, um, of, of uh, complexity and, and sophistication of the manufacturing profile, um, of, of upgrading uh, within uh, value chains and so on. Um, as, as part of uh, technological intensity and upgrading. Um, and in particular, when we look at uh, medium and high-tech industries, um, these are seen to be kind of in, in general, obviously closer to the, the technological frontier, I guess kind of by definition, um, and to bring various advantages for, um, for the catching up process um, in terms of uh, stronger spillover effects and, and, and linkages. Uh, important for, for competitiveness, generally tend to be more um, intensive in R&D and, and innovation and so on. Um, and from some of the work which Antonio and I have been doing, um, also one of the interesting um, characteristics of uh, medium and high tech industries is that they don't seem to follow the same kind of deindustrialization path um, as does manufacturing um, as a whole. So we, we find for, for aggregate manufacturing, it, it tends to follow this well-known in, inverted U um, and kind of a level off and, and decline at high levels of income per capita. We don't see the same pattern with medium and high-tech industries. Um, so it suggests that it, it remains a, a feasible industrialization path even for, for higher income um, e economies. And then um, for, for, for late industrializers and even for kind of late, late industrializers, um, technological upgrading is, uh, while difficult, but is, is, is crucial for, for the catching up process. Um, and then, yeah, just briefly in terms of uh, linking this with um, comparative advantage, um, I think an understanding of, of dynamic comparative advantage and uh, defiance of static comparative advantage is in some ways at the core of, of structural transformation and, and catching up. Um, it's clear that a static comparative advantage is a kind of a dead end um, in terms of growth uh, for, for developing countries, um, goes against theory, empirical and historical evidence and so on. Um, let me actually skip some of this because of time. Um, um, and yeah, just briefly on productive capabilities, which I'll, I'll, I'll come to in more detail in the context of 4R specifically. Um, and it is something which, uh, for example, Antonio has been working on for, for a long time. Um, again, seen as, as important for, for industrialization, for structural transformation, for sustainable growth. Um, and while there's different ways of approaching productive capabilities, we can broadly see these as, as uh, sets of, of uh, production capabilities and, and technological capabilities, um, really closely linked with, with, with learning, um, crucial for, for the catching up process, um, for competitiveness, um, and, and so on. Um, so yeah, the reason why I wanted to spend a few minutes just kind of um, 
in a way recapping um, on, on these issues from a, a structuralist perspective um, is to maybe you know, suggest that even when we're looking at the, the issues of, of, of 4R, the new technologies and so on, insofar as they're, even though they're qualitatively different, but I think some of these um, perspectives uh, remain important, which I'll, I'll come, come to more in a few minutes. Um, so yeah, obviously there's a bit of a debate around for our, you know, to what extent is it a revolution and so on. Um, I think, you know, there do seem to be uh, aspects that are indeed um, qualitatively different and, and new associated with the, the 4 R. I'm referring it to as, as, as 4 R. Uh, I think in the, the title of, of today's webinar is uh, Industry 4.0, but I'm, I'm just using these interchangeably. Um, and we can also note that the, the internet, the diffusion of um, technology in the first instance, but also more broadly, is exponentially faster in the 4 R than in um, early industrial revolutions. Um, and uh, you know, it's clear that it's uh, it's distinguished by you know, the the velocity, the speed of change, um, by how wide ranging the scope of the impact is, and uh, wide ranging and uh, and systemic. Um, but ha having said that, I think it's also worth pointing out that not all of the changes associated with 4R are, um, are dramatic and, and disruptive. So it includes both those sort of kind of disruptive or, or revolutionary changes, as well as more um, incremental and, and uh, evolutionary uh, changes um, in technology, um, as, as well as in, in broader impact. Uh, yeah, just uh, briefly, because I guess it's not the focus of, of uh, today's uh, webinar in particular, but um, perhaps some, some of the earlier ones, um, there's obviously a, a really uh, large and growing literature around uh, the effects of the 4R on, on employment. Um, theoretical and empirical debates around the, the likely and, and actual impact on overall levels of, of employment. Um, and I guess we can disentangle various channels through which the 4R is affecting um, employment. Um, on, uh, there's the direct impact through the, the changing nature of uh, production within countries. Um, I guess in, in most developing countries, it's currently on, on too small a scale to have a, a major impact. Um, an indirect impact through the, the, the introduction of our technologies in other countries um, and the impact of that on, on uh, imports and exports, um, as well as in some cases the reshoring of, of production, um, you know, displacement and productivity effects, substitution effects, product demand effects, and so on. I guess I won't go through this in, in detail, um, but perhaps um, uh, more significant uh, effects um, on, on the composition of employment. Um, and I think this is this is where it's sort of indisputable um, differences by, by skills level, by uh, um, occupation, by, by sector, and so on, um, as well as effects on, on the nature of work um, and the organization of, of, of work. So coming to the, the developing country context, which um, is a, a, in a way framing today's uh, webinar, um, it's clear that amongst developing countries, uh, there's a huge degree of, of uh, heterogeneity uh, for instance, between uh, China and South Korea and uh, uh, countries at, at the other end of the, of the spectrum. Um, so we really need to, to kind of break down further the developing country context because it is so diverse. Um, and I think that diversity is in, in the different uh, and interconnected aspects. Um, in, in prior conditions, in terms of the degree of technological advancement, um, the extent of industrialization, skills levels, um, the capacity and, and sophistication of, of, of policy and so on. And then obviously linked to those prior conditions um, in the degree of um, adoption as well as um, production of, uh, of 4 our technologies. There's also a high degree of um, heterogeneity within countries, obviously. Um, if you have a mentioned by sector, but we can also just think by, by firm size and uh, by, by different dimensions. Um, so just to take the example of uh, robotization, um, the, the use of robots is obviously very uneven um, across sectors uh, to, to compare, for example, auto, one of the sectors with the, uh, probably uh, the highest robot intensity with other sectors where uh, robotization is, is uh, significantly lower. So one of the axes of um, kind of heterogeneity within countries will also be linked to uh, the degree of industrialization um, as well as the sectoral composition um, of, of their manufacturing. And yeah, it's also worth pointing out that many developing countries are still undergoing elements of the early industrial revolutions. So these are not the linear stages that get completed before you kind of move to the next one. 
Um, and I think particularly in the um, in the African context, many low income um, African countries, it's not just the third industrial revolution, but even earlier ones, um, are, there are still elements of, of, of that which are, are, are being um, undergone. Um, so some of the ways which I think uh, the developing country context is uh, is specific. Um, and obviously the, this is a very sweeping here just after I've said that we need to take account of the, the heterogeneity within developing countries. Um, but in general, uh, developing countries are further from the, the technological frontier, with a, a wider gap well, in, in different aspects of capabilities, um, but including in, in digital capabilities, um, less competitive in, in technology and, 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 uh, and skills, particularly in the kinds of skills that are, are disproportionately needed um, in the, 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 the occupations um, and roles that are, are, are growing in, in the 4R. Um, on the one hand, the, the, the lower cost of, of, of labor um, and the low unit labor costs in developing countries perhaps reduces the incentive to, to the cost incentive to automate. But I think we also see that some of the, the impetus for, for automation um, is not necessarily cost driven, but driven by um, quality controls, requirements within GBCs and so on. So um, whilst uh, the automation pressure is perhaps mitigated to some extent by the differences in, in uh, labor costs, but as in other cases, it's driven by, by other factors. Um, and I think we're also seeing the, you know, the beginnings of um, some reshoring. I, I don't see it as at, at a massive scale as, as yet, but uh, it, it's, it is uh, clearly evident. Um, some reshoring of, of manufacturing jobs to, to developing countries. Um, I think, let me just skip this because of time and uh, just jump to, to uh, some of the, the, the policy issues. So the, the kind of the overall um, conceptual approach um, to a policy perspective um, that I would take here is very much one of approaching the 4R um, as, as part of a broader industrialization um, and structural change agenda. Um, not something kind of uh, really separate from that. And I think that even that's, that comes through even in the framing of uh, the topic of, of today's webinar. So I think success in, a, in the 4R at the country level, it, it requires everything that you need to succeed in industrialization. Um, it also requires more than that, but it doesn't require less than that. So whatever is needed in industrialization is also needed for kind of 4R success, as well as uh, additional requirements. Um, and there is a potential for, uh, for, for our technologies and for, for digital industrial policy to in some ways catalyze um, uh, your in progress within industrialization, part of what I've termed a transformative industrialization um, agenda. And I think these need to be, to be approached in a, in a really integrated way. Um, so yeah, just to kind of really underscore the importance um, of um, existing industrial uh, capabilities um, in order to develop uh, the, the kinds of capabilities which are really for our specific. Um, so the existing productive capabilities within manufacturing as well as more broadly um, are important for, for the adoption and, and the use of for our technologies um, as well as even for, for producing them where firms or, or countries are able to. Um, the importance of, uh, of continual learning um, and as I've said, the, the, the requirements for kind of for our success are, are industrialization requirements um, plus. So in that sense, you need both the kind of traditional capabilities for industrialization as well as um, and linked to that um, new and, and emerging um, capabilities. Um, and I think um, Antonio has been uh, has developed some, some thinking, which has also been taken up by, by Unido around um, basic, um, intermediate and advanced uh, capabilities and the need for a, kind of a broad array of, of uh, capabilities. Um, so in terms of uh, kind of breaking down, but yeah, as, uh, still at a, a quite broad level, uh, kind of overall uh, policy approach, um, what I think are some of the, the, the key elements for, for countries um, is to recognize that there, there are various components to, to narrowing the gap in, in, um, in uh, capabilities and digital capabilities specifically. Um, and that different kinds of uh, four hour uh, activities have got their own kind of uh, thresholds and, and, and preconditions um, which, which, which need to be met. Um, and you know, as I've said, uh, to intensify the focus on strengthening um, productive capabilities in manufacturing broadly, um, not just in four hour industries. 
um, countries uh, need to identify the, the kind of transversal enablers um, which are required for uh, success in the 4R. Um, and, and these range from, from, from skills, and uh, I'll come to, to a bit more on skills in the, in the next slide, the capabilities that I've talked about, different aspects of, of the digital infrastructure, um, regulatory and governance framework, um, and so on. And I think, yeah, obviously there's debates in, in the literature and in policy around uh, leapfrogging and the extent to which leapfrogging is even feasible. I think in practice, the opportunities for leapfrogging are fairly limited. I think there, there are opportunities and some of the far out technologies can, sorry, some of the far out technologies can provide a, a, a basis for, for leapfrogging. Um, but obviously it's, it's difficult and from the kind of perspective I've been suggesting where you need that incremental learning and the building blocks and so on, but where there are those opportunities, uh, they do need to be identified and exploited. Um, and it's important for, for, for kind of a countries for our policies to be integrated with uh, the other policies, innovation policies, uh, industrial policies, obviously, um, and so on. I've seen some countries kind of you know, having a, like a subset of, uh, you know, for our, obviously you need a four hour focus, but really integrated um, with, uh, with other uh, sets of, of policies. Um, in, in terms of you know, some more specific elements, um, obviously, uh, skills development is, is is key. It's always easy to say skills is one of those kind of motherhood and apple pie things. Nobody's going to disagree that you need more uh, skills, but it does remain important. Um, and especially, but not limited to uh, you know, what's been broadly called kind of uh, future skills. Um, digital infrastructure is obviously a key. And when I think about uh, you know, my own country um, and many other countries on the, on the African continent, it's about getting the basics in place. Um, of uh, the, the speed, the cost, the reliability of, of IC inf ICT infrastructure, even if that's kind of third industrial revolution, but it's a must before kind of going to something um, more sophisticated. Um, uh, yeah, I think there's uh, uh, fiscal policy issues in, involved here, um, how to socialize uh, some of the risk and associated with that, some of the returns um, for, from producing um, and adopting new technologies um, where these uh, ha have broader um, externalities um, and benefits, for example, in terms of, uh, of growth pulling, um, where there's fiscal support for those, uh, you know, again, tying those in a kind of rents management way to, um, to investment and, and uh, upgrading. Um, I think there's also a kind of set of, of, of policy issues around uh, regulation and, and, and governance. Um, the changing technologies bring their own uh, gaps in existing uh, regulation, uh, and it's important for, for governments to kind of be, be agile and identify those, uh, th those gaps. And I think there's, there's really uh, key opportunities uh, for learning um, from what other governments are doing, which are perhaps um, in, in countries where the technologies are and these changes are more advanced and not in a kind of copy and paste kind of way. Um, but I think they... Um, yeah, there, there, there's, there's, we don't have to also reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah, similarly, in terms of, of competition policy, there's aspects um, that are specific to the digital um, economy in relation to market power and so on. Um, and it's important for competition authorities to be really um, on top of those um, because the technologies are, are, are changing so fast. Um, various uh, regulatory issues in relation to, to data, including your know, data ownership, data quality, so data sovereignty, um, and, and so on, as well as broader issues around uh, digital sovereignty um, and uh, associated uh, um, ethical issues. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to leave it there because of time. Um, these are just some of the kind of uh, four hour related activities that we're doing within uh, my center. I won't speak to them in, in detail, but we're always happy to connect with um, other scholars working on related things. Um, and we're really happy and Antonio has been involved in, in, in playing a, a key role in, in, in some of these activities and uh, uh, happy to hear about what other scholars are working on and, and link up and collaborate. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona, for your presentation. It was really nice and inspiring. Uh, let me remind everybody that after the free presentation, we have, we have time for Q&A, so prepare your question. Uh, now I'd like to uh, invite Antonio Andreoni to, to present. So Antonio, please. Sure, thanks so much. Let me just uh, share my screen so that 
Can you see my screen at the moment? Yeah. Perfect. Excellent. So thanks so much for the invitation. I'll uh, I'll try to um, be uh, quite quite uh, brief, although there are quite a few references to work that uh, we've been doing over the last few years on this specific topic, and I'm very happy to share some of the reflection. And I thought a way to organize quite a lot of uh, materials was to actually structure my presentation around five questions. Um, these five questions are partially already addressed by, uh, by Fiona's presentation, but I hope I will give you a number of um, quite specific perspective on what these questions uh, are about. And as you can see, our, the first one is about what is really revolutionary about 4IR. And this is something that, especially when people look at things like robots, uh, the question is, is it really something new as much as when we talk about ICT sensors and so on, what is really new about this, this type of technologies? And I think it's important to start from this question because this will have implication in terms of how we understand um, digital applications, how we understand the possibilities for leapfrogging and uh, how they work in practice in uh, a number of sectors of the chain. And finally, how we understand the role of policy, especially in uh, uh, developing countries who are trying to catch up in, in, these, in these specific areas. And in particular, we'll uh, uh, also look at uh, the new kind of discussion around not simply how 4IR is a, a potential revolution in technologies, but also in business models and what uh, the nature of digital platform uh, implies for a, a new way of looking at, looking at industrial policy issues. As a spoiler, uh, this is the kind of um, uh, kind of answers that I've tried to articulate in my presentation. The first one will build on the concept of technology fusion, which we've been developing with Ajun Chang and other colleagues, which in fact is not a new concept, was introduced already in the 90s by Japanese scholars who were looking at integration of technologies like mechatronics. And I will explain why it's such an important concept in understanding the revolutionary nature of digitalization. The second question is going to look at uh, both the cross sector, there is lots of emphasis about the transversal nature of digital technologies as a sort of new uh, general purpose technologies. But in fact, when we look at specific sector value chain, we see that what we call, let's say, sensors or IoT or uh, uh, automation, it's very different. Uh, and so there is some element of sector specificity to take into account. I will also uh, then move towards the discussion of uh, why, uh, because of we have these forms of technology fusions and we have all this uh, both transversal and sector specific application, why we need uh, foundational capabilities and what we mean with foundational capabilities. And this is, I will be building on a paper we have recently published in a, in a special issue. And finally, I'll try to uh, focus on two set of uh, industrial policy issues that are particularly relevant here. One which is related to where the state position itself in terms of financing along the uh, uh, scaling up of new technologies. Um, and I will talk about the, what we uh, called with Fiona the middle income technology trap. And also we look at digital skills. And here I would like to bring some example from developing countries. We've been working quite a lot in uh, uh, least developed countries or low middle income countries. And you realize that you know, uh, there is a, problem around identifying the right type of skills profiles to develop, but there is a more fundamental problem around the institutions and how you change fundamentally the incentive structures within institutions. So we've done some uh, discrete choice experiment, for example, in Tanzania, and, and now we're starting in other countries to look at exactly these type of problems. And as I said, I will conclude discussing not just the technology aspect, but also the competition policy aspect. And I will build on a number of contributions here. Uh, and in particular, I'm, I would like to use this occasion to invite you to, in, a, in 21 days, uh, the book at the center of this slide, uh, which uh, is the result of work done uh, over the last three, four years with Fiona, Simon Roberts and others, uh, also Tim Sturgeon and other colleagues uh, who have been working on digitalization for many years. In the context of South Africa, we'll give you some good example and cases going from exactly mining equipment to agriculture, to automotive and so on and so on, plastics and other industries where digitalization is happening. And I think um, we really need to move beyond 
uh, very stylized stories about what digitalization is and try to understand really what is on the ground, how firms are engaging in this space. Now, let me start with the first question. But many of you are familiar with this version of the, uh, of, of the story, right? Over the last probably five years between World Economic Forum, lots of UN agencies, in different ways they've been telling this story, right? There are stages, there are all these revolution happening, there are key technologies that support each revolution. Uh, this was the version that myself and uh, a colleague of mine did for the UNIDO Industrial Development Report. And fundamentally, when you start looking at these technologies, you realize that in a bit more depth, that actually many of these technology coexist. In fact, they coexist across countries because as also Priyana was mentioning, when you look at low and middle income countries and you visit factories and you try to see what they're using, it's a quite mixed bag, right? You can find some machinery that has been now sensorized, some people who say, well, we collect data, but we don't know what to do it. So we don't have the data analytics, even if we start having the data uh, and so on and so forth. So you have a quite a mixed bag of experiences. And this happens also in uh, advanced economies where uh, a number of small medium enterprises find more difficult to make investment in these areas. So you have across countries this co-presence of all these different technologies, but also you have something quite unique uh, about uh, these uh, revolution. The fact that we have lots of different uh, clusters of technologies. Again, this is a typical list that uh, you would find in many, many report. And each of these technologies are actually different stages of maturity. So if in the same uh, 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 bag of uh, for IR technology, you put, for example, robots and you put uh, nanotechnologies or biotechnologies or uh, computing technology, quantum technologies. These are technologies have very different stages of maturity, which means that at the same time, we are talking about uh, technologies that have been used, adopted, uh, diffused across countries in, in very different ways. And each of them have different requirements uh, in the adoption and, and so on. So the, the key issue is that there is this plurality of technology and technology systems. And what we are seeing now, it's not so much that they, each of them is applied in uh, different type of sectors or industry. What we see is that they are increasingly fused into quite complex integrated technology systems. I encourage you to look at the work, for example, of Gregory Tasse, his book on, uh, on the uh, technology imperative in 2007 already was pointing out to be ICT was pushing in this direction, but now we are seeing an acceleration of the degree of technology fusion across uh, all these different technology uh, 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 platforms. And this means also that this introduces a, a meta level of uh, revolutionary disruption type of uh, effect. It's not that each single technologies are changing the scenario, the paradigm, it's their integration which is making uh, things that were not possible in the past possible. So if you take a typical example, you know, a drone technology and you start unpacking what goes within that and how all these different things are, uh, this is something we've done for a piece for a United Nations Industrial Development Organization. You see that actually lots of these technologies individually were existing in the past, but uh, in many cases are now in integrated and fused in technology systems and in doing that have been updated and been transformed by themselves that would, not, would have not been possible in the past. So this convergence and fusion of technology is really central here. Let me move to my second question, which is really looks at this element of transversality and sector specificity. Now, many people have approached the digitalization, the new paradigm, emphasizing a lot the transversal nature. They've been saying, well, there is a new uh, uh, general purpose technology that is going to be behind this new industrial revolution. But again, when you look at specific, you start unpacking application at specific sectoral level, as I was mentioning before, if you look at the different forms of intelligent automation that you see in the manufacturing sector, in lots of processing activities, and you compare it with application, for example, in agriculture or uh, in mining, in construction and so on, you realize that actually there is lots of sector specificity as well. So sensors that can be used to make a production line uh, able to generate data constantly and uh, uh, transform this data in energy efficiency improvement uh, are, of course, the same type of technology that you would apply in the mining sector. But in the mining sector, predictive maintenance 
especially in uh, complex machinery, extremely expensive machinery, play a different role in the processing, in the functionalities of the product and so on. So what I'm trying to say here is that we have to be aware of the fact that yes, there is transversality, but there is also lots of sector specificity. And this matters a lot when we talk about industrial policy for digitalization. Because if you emphasize only the transversal level and you invest only on that transversal element, then companies might find difficult to translate that new digital platform technology into a specific sectoral application. So a mix of uh, uh, reference to these both issues is, is important. And of course, by having lots of this transversality, we also start seeing lots of industrial mutation. So what we used to call agriculture looks much more from a technological point of view, a manufacturing process. What we used to call a service process start looking much more, a, uh, again, a integrated uh, uh, manufacturing system uh, type of application, especially as I will mention later when we look at modularity in the business model. Um, apologize, this is, doesn't look like the paste and copy from the article uh, that I showed you before, the, which we call Natura non facit saltus. It's not particularly effective. But what we do here is to actually, in this article, to build on lots of evidence that has been collected uh, across several countries, including Argentina, Brazil, and others where uh, we were looking exactly at the uh, kind of sector-specific application and cross-sectoral application and uh, identifying new elements of technology fusion. What you will see here in the article, uh, uh, I'm very happy to share it, is that you, you will identify an application that cut across sectors, but also operate along value chain with changes in business model of firms. So a supplier now will manage their uh, supply to their first year or uh, system integrators company by using uh, different forms of IoT or by specializing and modularizing some of their activities in a way that was not possible before. The cross-cutting element, which is uh, in a sense uh, uh, probably the only real uh, platform element that cut across all this sector is the increasing role of data and in particular the intelligent use of data. Now, this means that, uh, and I will mention this later, we are not just talking about the technologies, but focusing on the information that these technologies are able to generate and how this information is then or not used. So there are, again, two levels here of the problem. You cannot use the data if you do not collect the data. So you have to have industrial policy to be able to censorize manufacturing processes, agricultural processes, whatever they are. But at the same time, we need to build the capacity to use the data in an intelligent way. And the funny thing is that in many developing countries, even when you start using uh, uh, sensors to collect data, you still do not know how to apply them. And so you, have, you visit companies where they say, well, we don't really know what to do with this data at this stage, right? So the problems can be much more uh, mixed than, than uh, we think. But certainly the amount of uh, increasing use of data uh, that all the indicators uh, suggest um, is, is, is really increasing in an in a, uh, uh, absolutely uh, incremental, exponential type of way. Now, one of the implications of what I just said, so the fact that we have technology fusion and that we have both transversal, transversal and sector-specific application, which is a dominant role of data, is that lots of the uh, uh, engagement and potential leapfrogging into digitalization actually relies on a quite complex set of capabilities because you are no more simply specializing in, let's say, uh, mechanical engineering. You are actually trying to have mechanical engineering, which use also uh, knowledge coming from uh, uh, computing technologies or uh, electronics and so on. So you have lots of domains of science and technology that are required in order to use and adopt and effectively deploy these technologies. This is why in this paper with, uh, with Adin Chang and uh, Matteo Slabrunie, we have been looking at this problem of leapfrogging and what uh, we, we can, you know, how can we can frame the problem of leapfrogging. So leapfrogging makes sense when we can identify a number of foundational capabilities, which are not simply related to skills, but also related to organizations who are able to commit resources, invest, uh, uh, commit financial resources over a longer period of time, or are able to organize uh, technologies, so set up production line that include these technologies. 
once you have the capacity to leapfrog because you have these foundational capabilities into a new technology domain, let's say the application of data science or the application of nanotechnologies or IoT, then you can start seeing the transversal nature and the technology fusion I was talking before. So in this sort of graph, we put together these three steps. The first one related to the foundational capabilities, the second one related to what is the place in which you leapfrog to, what is the cluster of technologies you are developing, and how these technologies are applied then across sectors and potentially, again, innovated in their application uh, in, these, uh, in these different sectors towards the markets. So this is a more complex way of looking at the problem and the complexity, it's not you know, just because we want to make it up. It's just because th this is the way in which in practice firms are engaging. And so when you visit uh, like uh, in, in this cover, this is the cover of our book is from a company called Multotech, which is uh, a, a quite an important leading company in uh, uh, mining equipment, in production of mining equipment. And what you see there is a specific technologies that they were able to develop after many years of dealing with quite basic set of uh, uh, production processes. And this is why we, when we talk about foundational capabilities, we are talking about a broad array of capabilities, basic, intermediate, and also systemic at the level of infrastructure in the country that play a role in each functional area that are listed here. This is the framework that we developed for UNIDO IDR, the Industrial Development Report, a few years ago. And um, what you notice is that when you start looking at this problem from this perspective, you start realizing that many countries are not ready to leapfrog exactly because they miss this type of capabilities. At the moment, we are developing a toolkit for governments to actually assess their, if you want, readiness in terms of digitalization by identifying indicators which allows to exactly match out these basic, intermediate, more advanced and infrastructural capabilities. And this is why the readiness is often missing. In uh, one of the other contributions I was mentioning before, we also stress the fact that uh, the story I just told might make people feeling, okay, there is nothing digital happening in developing countries, which is actually far from real. There are a number of pockets of digitalization, which are very much related to the fact that uh, lots of these production processes are now global, which means that a company in South Africa producing, let's say, in the automotive sector, producing a, a car for the European or export market, will tend to have very similar processes arranged uh, with digital technology as much as uh, sister plants operating in Spain, in Thailand, and so on. This is the case of, for example, Volkswagen in uh, in South Africa, or the case of other uh, companies in other uh, sectors like plastics and so on. What is problematic, what is specifically challenging about developing countries is that these are only pockets of digitalization, operating in an environment where there is lots of need for retrofitting. So the same company which is supplying components for the Volkswagen plant in South Africa will have to do themselves lots of retrofitting, restructuring in order to be able to supply the international companies, the multinational companies with components that meet the requirements that only digital technologies can provide. And this means that the overall environment, the systemic nature of the challenge makes uh, industrial policy even more uh, important in this space. Let me just mention a couple of problems. The first one, uh, and here I'm building on some work we've done comparing different industrial policy approaches with Fiona across three countries looking at this aspect of the middle income technology trap, and in particular also the work we've done in South Africa with uh, Tim Sturgeon, uh, Justin uh, uh, Burns, and Anthony Black, and Simon Roberts in the context of digital skills. In, uh, in the paper with Fiona, we stress the fact that um, the countries who are trying to uh, uh, escape from the middle income trap, the so called middle income trap, are basically facing four challenges. And these challenges are related to their position in the global market and, and condition of trade, are related to their position in value chains, are related to the way in which they are uh, connected to value chains globally, but also backward in their local production system. And finally, the extent to which they can keep pace with technological change. Let me just focus on two of those because are really matters here for our discussion. 
if you want to be able to engage with the global value chain in a successful way, uh, in a digital context, in a new paradigm, you need digital skills. And these digital skills, as I mentioned before, are now cutting across several domains. You need to have people who are able to do programming, but at the same time operating in uh, digital design, data management, visualization, analytics. And so these kind of more advanced digital skills can be only developed if you at the same time have a strong base in uh, advanced literacy, numeracy, ICT skills, right? So there is this element of cumulativeness there that matters. Also, many of these technologies, when they are deployed, they rely on uh, so-called infra technologies. So data management systems, uh, 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 labs that allow you to test and prototype new sensors, new 3D printers, and so on. And of course, these are infrastructure that uh, are quasi public good in nature. So the state can invest in those um, as it has happened in uh, all the countries we managed to industrialize. But in a developing country, often they are missing, which means that, again, you might have skilled people, but these skilled people are forced to migrate, to leave the country because they do not have neither companies or a public technology intermediate institution that support these scaling up of technologies. And institutions also, particularly in the education sector, are pretty much behind in the sense that often you do not have a simple problem of training uh, young generation. The problem is to retrain the old generation who is supposed to teach how to engage with these technologies, right? So when you have an underinvested investment in the education sector and technologies develop very fast, lots of the trainers themselves are actually not capable to do the kind of training that is needed. So the problem is much more fundamental in terms of how you retrain your training trainers, how do you create programs that allow to uh, deploy these technologies in the real firms that are so providing job training, on the job training, and so on and so forth. So the problem becomes, uh, goes beyond the simple uh, introdu introduction on a new curricula or a new uh, uh, program for training. The other problem is that very often you, end up, you have lots of uh, gaps in investment, in particular in the intermediate stage of development of technologies, uh, this is using a, a technological readiness levels uh, uh, metric, you basically do not have investment. And if you do not have investment that they risk uh, the scaling up of the technology, you might end up in a situations where uh, fundamentally no one is investing in key stages of the innovation chain. And you have lots of innovation happening because there is some smart people doing supported with some basic research, but these do not land into commercial activity. And in countries where like US, Japan, Germany, where you have big amount of investment, either in basic science and in uh, you have big firms who are willing to pick up the technology, you actually have just a gap in the middle. In uh, middle income countries, the gap tend to be across the board. So you have both a gap in the middle and you have underinvestment in basic research and underinvestment in uh, uh, the uh, absorption of the technology at the end of that spectrum. So the story is more complex than actually just throwing money at research or skills and so on. It's really about the selectivity of the intervention along stages of the value chain. Let me just conclude with the last question. I'll take just one minute here, we'll be very brief, uh, and I will reference the paper. So far, I've been talking about technology skills, foundational capabilities, technology fusion, application of technologies. But all these things happen only because you have new business models that allow these things to operate, right? Um, as Tim Sturgeon has been articulating very clearly, we have three key new business models in place, one which is related to open innovation, one which is related to modularity, and one related to platform. Now, we quite, quite of us, quite, you know, a lot of us have heard about open innovation in many contexts now of data, digital, standardization, and so on. Modularity is a bit more complex because there are different degrees of modularity. Modularity can happen at product level, can happen at uh, software level, can happen in terms of division of labor between firms. What is becoming, but in, in a sense, is something that, again, we have seen for quite some time. Uh, modularization would, would made possible to produce things like the Dreamliner or very complex products like airplanes. Without that, it would not be possible. 
what we haven't seen in the past that we are seeing now and that requires a very specific uh, uh, set of intervention is the emergence of platform and platform of platform that are controlling uh, the key uh, ingredient, the key asset of the fourth industrial revolution. And they are extremely heterogeneous. This is what we have been doing with Simon Roberts, trying to split up some of the characteristics of them and building on some uh, 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 broader mapping out of these technologies and platform technologies. And what they have have an also unique characteristic that they tend to uh, have this, uh, their value increase and the value of the data that they use increase uh, with uh, their capacity to uh, colonize different technology application product and markets. So we have lots of new forms of monopoly capitalism and network effects that make extremely difficult to uh, operate in this space. And what we do in this uh, paper was exactly to try to say, so if we move towards a context where the business models are changing, we cannot simply support with industrial policy the capability development process, the learning process. We also need to regulate those value capture and value extraction type of activities that are part of the new paradigm. And here we try to talk about the need for an entrepreneurial regulatory state that is able to understand the very different manifestation of data and digital platform and capabilities in the context of industrialization of middle income countries and try to see how to integrate industrial and competition policy to achieve what already two great scholar, Ali Samsted and Aljit Singh used to call optimal competition, which is reaching those levels of competition that on the one hand allow for network effects to operate, but at the same time allow for more inclusiveness into uh, the industrial landscape. I'll stop there, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Antonio, for your inspiring presentation. Uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Veronica Robert to present. Okay, thank you very much, Lorenzo. Thank you to Antonio and Fiona for your presentation also. Um, I, my presentation is in some way uh, similar to yours, in others different, so I, I hope the, the audience could complement uh, all the things that we brought to them. So I will share my screen. Thank you very much also for the organizers of this activity. And uh, as long as I am part of the Center of Economic uh, uh, Studies for Development, uh, also I, I want to thank to Antonio and Fiona for, for being in, in, in this virtual place all together. So, um, uh, I, I, I have not such important uh, tracking on research on uh, industry 4.0 uh, up to now. I've been working this subject for the last year and uh, I, I hope uh, I, 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 I was uh, thinking a few things that I think it could be interesting for you. Also, I, I would like to say that uh, although this presentation I, I elaborated by myself, I'm part of a bigger group uh, in which Lorenzo is part of, Darío, Ignacio, Nicolás, Cecilia, Juan and Sebastián, that we are working on together in this kind of topic. So I, I would like to say, uh, give credit to them too. So uh, the, 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 the title of the presentation is COVID-19 4.0 industry and now what? And uh, what I, I, I go into to, to bring here is a perspective for developing countries that uh, have some manufacturing capacities already. That is uh, middle income uh, countries and the problems of the middle income countries that you have already addressed. So, uh, obviously, uh, something that all of you already know, COVID ha has uh, an important impact on production and industrial activities. And uh, along the last year, uh, industrial activities has been recovering uh, in, uh, in, 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 with a good rate. But uh, behind this series, we have several sources of heterogeneity. Heterogeneity is by geographical area, by sector, by 
size of firm by idiosyncratic attributes of the firm. We have lost manufacturing capacities also along this year. And uh, uh, what we have uh, seen uh, in uh, so in a, in a survey for two 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 hundred uh, firms from Buenos Aires province is that the rate that they recover the activities in industrial activities are strongly connected with some development in uh, digitalization process innovation product is uh, linked to, to, to have a, 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 um, uh, a, 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 a highest recovery rate, but also organizational change, commercialization change, and labor process management, especially, especially when uh, home working is we are talking about, or new change for commercialization. So, However, these problems in manufacturing activities, uh, we have a, a, long, <laughs> a long tradition that we, uh, along, uh, we, we have been, uh, been losing industrial employment along the last, uh, the last 10, almost 10 now. And also if we have, uh, we have a, a, a the trend, the previous trend in regional perspective, we also uh, are seeing a loss of uh, manufacturing employment along the last years, nothing that you don't already know. And uh, as uh, several of your works have uh, documented, this desindustrialization process for Latin American countries is not the same that the desindustrialization process for developed countries. And uh, we have uh, collected some evidence that shows that uh, developed countries retain activities in knowledge-based sectors. Meanwhile, uh, middle-income countries are specialized in manufacturing activities that are not based on income sectors, on, on uh, knowledge sectors, and also what we could see is that uh, R&D activity in uh, developed countries, in high income countries, is uh, still concentrated in manufacturing activities, knowledge intensive manufacturing activities. Uh, even in those sectors that have an important tradition in the uh, natural resources, like uh, North, Nordic countries or, or, or United States, the uh, R&D uh, expenditure is still concentrated in manufacturing activities, even more than in knowledge intensive sectors. So what uh, we would say to that, okay, we have two types of the, of the industrialization, mature and premature. But mature desindustrialization is most uh, a selective desindustrialization and reindustrialization in highly technology dynamic sectors with strong change in the organization of production. So, as Mark Twain says, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. Manufacturing is still living out there. So, um, so what is what's going on in manufacturing sector? What is what is uh, what what we have in manufacturing sector? Oh, let me move this. It's very annoying. Okay, um, four point is a major organizational change characterized by manufacturing enterprises adoption uh, of new ICT generation that is characterized by the massive use of data and the growing computational capacity for real-time processing and extracting meaning of those data for decision-making process and for developing a new series of products and services based on information. That's what uh, uh, Antonio has developed very neatly in, in, her, in his presentation. The concept was introduced in Hanover 10 years ago. Uh, this uh, year we have 10 years ago. Uh, of the first uh, mention of industry 4.0 uh, 
And uh, this concept was, uh, okay, I, I'm going to skip this because we have already saw that. And this concept cannot be seen without taking into account the, uh, the, 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 the hegemonic dispute on the retaining manufacturing activities in, uh, in, in central uh, countries. The, the foreign point of uh, strongly linked to industrial policy. And uh, this is, mm, is not the first time because we have already seen this in the 90s when the rebrand of uh, just-in-time mm, means of production uh, by the name of lean manufacturing, uh, when Japan uh, uh, threat very, very heavily the capabilities in manufacturing to United States. So I, the first thing that we have to keep in mind when we talk about uh, 4.0 industrialization in developing countries is that is part of a dispute that we are not being part directly, but it will affect us. And uh, the first uh, point that we will just keep in mind that uh, is that um, is that uh, is an opportunity because during the nineties, industrial policy was even not allowed to say. Uh, it loud and uh, now we can uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, uh, propose we can do we can uh, uh, enhance industrial policies for our productive systems in developing countries and this is in part a uh, 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 byproduct of this dispute at, at, at global scale. And uh, as you uh, have said, this is a four, uh, th there are four stages in technology, manufacturing technologies. And uh, this is the, the, the fourth one. We're we are, uh, going through the four, uh, the four steps. But I would like to say not what is different in these four a step, but what is in common with the other uh, with the other three steps in the history of industrial technologies? So um, this is what you already seen in several times, but perhaps you haven't seen these other pictures of 1.0 uh, industry uh, where we have uh, this. This is uh, the, 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 the relevance of machinery and not also the relevance of machinery, but also the relevance of interchangeable, interchangeable parts, something like uh, Ellie Whitney uh, proposed for US uh, firearms in the uh, United States that allow easily repair and consistent in production and uh, uh, enhance very much the American manufacturing system vis-a-vis England manufacturing system. And uh, also we have a 2.0 industry and also we have here machinery and we have see something that is very similar to other two that are parts that are interchangeable and also we have one process and we have several process linked each other in a systemic way. I, in a kind of flow of materials and parts in the industrial process. And we have 3.0 industry, and also we have the same dynamics of a flow of parts that are interchangeable, that are uh, common to the same process and, and standard process. We have in a system of production, several different process that are connected together in a systemic way. And also when we expand this to, 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 to system level, to, to economic level, we also have the same problem 
of system of systems uh, interconnected with materials and parts. So what is manufacturing and what is so important to growth? What are, uh, why United States was worried when he was losing uh, industrial capacity vis-a-vis -vis Japan in the 90s and why United States and Germany and Europe are uh, concern about the uh, industrial capabilities in, in China that, <laughs> that, that foster this new concept of industry 4.0. So we, we can find uh, in common in all, all those four steps of technology history that manufacturing uh, is a way of combining materials and input that flow in a contact flow, in a, in a constant flow, in a systemic process among several individual process that which is fitted by several providers to create product with minimal, with minimal uh, variance. I mean, uh, quality, quality product, product that you can control the quality of that product. So, what happened in, in this essential uh, definition of manufacturing, economy, economy of scope, learning, productivity gains, feedback loops with growth in a very old fashioned Caldor Verdun law. So uh, we can find a reference to this problem uh, along the history of economic thought. I just lead you this this uh, reference to Smith, to Marx, to Babbage, to Marshall, Young, Galdor, Rosenberg, Freeman, just to mention some of them. And uh, that the, the, what the, all they uh, agree is that division of labor, productivity and growth are linked together in a feedback loop, but also there are innovation in this uh, same, in this, in, in this same loop of uh, division of labor and learning. So, uh, if this is manufacturing, what, what is uh, technology of manufacturing aimed at? What is, could go, go wrong in manufacturing process? In fact, there are a lot of problems that, go, that could go wrong in manufacturing process. Why? Because there are several variances in machine and equipment, in materials, in quality, of those materials, different rates in processes, uh, in different processes along the, the layout of the, of, the, of the factory, of the plant, differences in natural resources, natural variation uh, of the quality of the, of the input and material, fluctuation in production and also in demand rates. So what is technology aimed at? It's, bas it's basically a problem of control, how to control heterogeneous flow of material and inputs in a constant or minimal variance product with, 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 uh, with, with, goal, with the goal of gaining quality, productivity, uh, minimal cost and flexibility with the aim of competitiveness and we also could add recently new flavors of competitiveness, uh, taking into account sustainability and differentiation of the product. So those are um, common features of manufacturing process in which we can or we should try to see the specific role of industry 4.0. Uh, so industry 4.0 as well as its predecessors is aimed to cope with all those principles uh, manufacturing process uh, could be assessed a problem control in a highly complex system which division of labor enhance productivity but also add significant layers of complexity digitalization could allow to better control this process within and without the firm, uh, and I would like to, to I, I would like to remember the paper of Richard Langlois on vanished hand in this topic. So, uh, as 
as long when we understand that production process is not only process of material, but also uh, a, da a data process, each, each process, each production process, each uh, welding or pressing or, um, or, 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 or process in chemical, in chemical industries uh, are process in which uh, flow materials from raw materials to products, but also flows data, data of those materials and data of those products. We can imagine how 4.0 uh, technologies will address several problems of manufacturing by itself, of manufacturing by its own uh, uh, a, a fabric, no? So, uh, ma Toyota manufacturing system, Kanban, Kaizen, and lean manufacturing obviously could benefit from digitalization. So, let's go back now to Argentina and uh, to our productive structure. How is our productive structure? <laughs> okay, uh, as uh, Fiona pointed uh, out for South African uh, reality, also in Argentina, we have a highly heterogeneous productive, uh, productive structure with enormous differences among regions, among sectors, among size, but also within them, productivity differences in uh, manufacturing SMEs in Argentina could reach four or five times uh, productivity of a firm, of a, a, a textile firm, uh, of a small textile firm in Buenos Aires province, may have until four times the same productivity that other firm with the same characteristic in the same regions with the same size. I mean, we have a lot of heterogeneity. We have these heterogeneity problems because, because we have several problems within the firms layout, equipment, low quality, far from technological frontier, qualification of labor. We have a lot of problems uh, in the, inside the firm, but also we have a lot of problems outside the firms, uh, like uh, incomplete uh, productive system and uh, low quality uh, institutions, for fostering productivity in firms. I'm sorry, I, I let this lie this in, in Spanish. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry for that. So, what we will have with COVID and new technologies, we will have a, a deepen structural heterogeneity. COVID will deepen those differences, survey uh, that we carry out is already shown those differences and organizational changes and digitalization that are being accelerated by COVID uh, context will also enhance uh, and deepen the problems of the heterogeneity among uh, firms in Argentina. And the Industry 4.0 will also have the same problem. So the recommendation for this highly heterogeneous structure product, uh, pro, uh, production structure should not be simply your plan is a mess, take it easy, buy some PLC, introduce some digital twins, and you will be fine because technology, of course, is not the solution to, of, to our problems. And I have a very beautiful uh, slide here uh, with a kind of um, uh, uh, with a, uh, what we say in this way in Argentina, uh, por más que la mona se vista de seda, mona se queda, or uh, in English, translated in English, with a monkey, with a dress, is still a monkey, and we will have problems uh, to introduce digitalization in firms that have several unresolved problems. So what industrial policy we will need, we will need as much as possible what adoption or development of 4.0 we have to do. We have to do an idiosyncratic adoption of those technologies according to the reality of different firms. 
and uh, um, will new technology solve structural problems? No, but 4.0 is a possible way to implement a broad industrial policy because it's not longer a bad word industrial policy in our region and in the world and we have to take this opportunity to enhance our production system and uh, our institutions that uh, foster technology adoption and capacity building in different in different sectors uh, so uh, we we will have to work in classic competitiveness problems and adoption of technology based on a diagnosis of those problems in the firm where could capacities could from so uh, here we have a map that we have elaborated with more than uh, 10,000 enterprises in um, vendors in 4.0 activities and uh, the those those uh, each node of this network represent a field of knowledge of the firm the firm uh, we, we use a crunch based database for elaborated network in which each firm declare in which uh, sectors of technology they have capabilities and uh, the, 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 the nodes in these networks are linked as long as there are more than five or ten I think ten firms with uh, sharing capacities in those same technologies and sectors at the same time as as you can see here uh, something like uh, Antonio uh, have already pointed out uh, industry 5.0 is a system of technology is not just one technology there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, 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 linkages and interconnection among them and capacity building will start on what we are uh, already having so as you can see uh, artificial intelligence and uh, new tech sectors are linked with software industry and software industry is also linked with industrial auto automation but also with classic manufacturing activities without classic manufacturing activities, we will not have enough competencies to provide uh, new technologies in, in this uh, breaking through uh, new technologies. Also perform uh, activities in highly uh, knowledge intensive sectors are also linked with them, like here we have a cluster of pharmaceutical biotechnology and healthcare uh, activities or energy energy is linked to uh, artificial intelligence but also to software industry and also to manufacturing so we cannot see technology like uh, just uh, deus ex machina that firms will take but they will develop from their own uh, present capabilities so uh, this is another representation of the same uh, network and just just going to, to the, the finish of my presentation. Where good capacities come from? It could come from, from industrial trajectory, from competencies in manufacturing process, for competencies in highly complex and critical manufacturing process, like knowledge intensive sectors, specialized suppliers and machinery, in new service sectors like software development. And here we have a, a, a specific problem for Argentina where we have a, a, a huge and very dynamic uh, sector in, in software industry, but it is focused on, uh, on deliver software for global value change. And we are really concerned on the capabilities of those sectors to offer uh, technology for our uh, industrial uh, structure. And, uh, and, and also we are very concerned about the possibilities of our uh, manufacturing SMEs 
to uh, compete for those resources, to those digital resources with global companies in software sector. So uh, here I, I will finish. Uh, I thank you, thank you very much for listening. And I'm sorry if I uh, spend more time that I should have. I, I think no, not, it's, but, uh, it's, it's perfect. Thank you, Veronica, for your presentation. It was really nice. Uh, we have uh, really some a few minutes to uh, Q and A. Uh, I don't see any question in the chat. Uh, I invite you to to put your questions there. Um, I would like to make some questions on my own to start to break the ice. Um, when hearing your presentations, um, my main concern is uh, about the implications on developing countries of adapting and just adapting these uh, for revolution technologies uh, that comes from uh, developed countries. And uh, I was wondering if that could be make more difficult uh, for developing countries to industrialize or not. And also uh, if these technologies uh, mm -hmm. would make uh, more difficult for developing countries to profit from industrialization. And uh, one of the reasons I'm thinking about this is that, um, as you mentioned, a, a key factor of uh, this new paradigm uh, is the generation process and use of data. Um, but the data that is generated by these technologies uh, may be appropriate by the provider uh, of the technology. I, I mean, this big international companies that you mentioned before. Uh, and I'm thinking that uh, they may appropriate also of the revenues of this, uh, of the use of this data. data. So uh, my question is, uh, can developing countries take full advantage of these uh, digital technologies by just adapting, uh, adopting, sorry, the, these technologies from developed countries? Uh, will not increase uh, developing countries' technological dependence and leave benefits mainly from developed countries. Uh, and in this regard, uh, I would, uh, I, I'm also thinking if it would be necessary for developing countries to develop these technologies by the go. And if so, uh, to what extent do you think it is big? Um, it is possible to do this uh, considering uh, the competition coming from big international players uh, and also considering uh, this uh, concept that Antonio mentioned uh, about technology, technology fusion, the, that I was thinking that uh, if, this, if one of the characteristics of this new technology um, is that uh, they combine different uh, technologies in one solution. Uh, maybe that would make more difficult for developing countries to um, catch up with this technology because they need to manage uh, different technologies uh, at the time. So that, that was my thought. Uh, I'd like to hear uh, your opinion about that. Uh, and we have uh, some uh, question in the chat. Sorry. Um, Alejandro say, uh, thanks for the presentations. Uh, what, uh, what's the implication of uh, for industrial revolution for global value change? Uh, do you think that uh, for industrial revolution is responsible for the stagnation retreat of global value change observed in recent years? Um, I don't know if, it, if there is another question. You know, if not, uh, if you can I, uh, Florence? Ah, sorry. Yes. Ah, you were raising your hands. I sorry, I didn't see that. that. No, okay. it's fine. So actually, I wanted to to build upon uh, your question. Um, uh, that I think it's very good, and just to add that if it's possible to distinguish between uh, uh, the implications of, of what you were asking, 
uh, in, in different, let's say, let's call it type of developing countries. Now, given the, the uh, heterogeneity that, that we have uh, across developing countries that was uh, highlighted in the presentations, and also linking to uh, what Antonio highlighted that there's great um, specificity in terms of uh, sectors, uh, sectors use of, of these uh, clusters of, of technologies and, and their combination. So yeah, uh, if that implies that, that we may have differentiated uh, effects in, in developing countries that related to, to their uh, uh, characteristics. Thank you, Flor. Um, maybe I should start to some reactions of the presenters to these, these questions. I don't know uh, who of you want to start. Uh, I, I can Fiona? go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'll just Thanks. make a, a brief comment on, on each of them because I see we don't have a lot of time and uh, I think some of the my co-presenters might be better uh, specialized on these. Um, on, on the first question, I mean, I think uh, as a broad approach, yes, I would agree that um, technology does need to be uh, context specific. Um, yeah, I think the, the degree, to, that, that's more true for some things than for others. So for example, if we're talking about the technology needed in a, an auto factory, it's not going to be too different um uh, whether that's located in an advanced economy or a developing economy um as compared to if we're talking about technology in the, the water sector or whatever which is likely to be uh, more context specific um i also agree with the, the the broad point in principle about wanting to for developing countries wanting to be um not only users but also producers of technologies of course the the threshold um, is much higher to be a producer than to be a, a, a user. Um, it's, it's much more difficult. The capabilities needed are, are, are much higher and so on. Um, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not impossible. Um, well, one of the slides which I, which I jumped was actually showing the, the distribution uh, from, from uh, Unido's last IDR, the way that they've classified uh, developing countries between um, uh, users and producers and uh, leaders and uh, followers and, and uh, laggards and so on. Um, and I think particularly um, in, uh, in, in partnership um, with uh, 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 firms in, in, in advanced economies and so on, or in, in niche industries. Um, I guess it, it links in a way to the, the question around uh, GVCs in, in, in the chat. Uh, from, from my perspective, I, I wouldn't really see, the, the, the question was asking whether for our technologies could be responsible for stagnation of, of uh, GVCs in recent years. Your know, personally, I, I wouldn't really see it uh, like that, but certainly I think these new technologies do have significant implications uh, for, for GVCs. Um, one of them being uh, the reshoring of, of some of the activities within GVCs, which would be, have been some of the parts of value chains, which would have been located in, in, in developing countries. Um, and then I, I think more broadly, the, the technological advancement raises the risks of developing countries being stuck in the the low value added uh, parts of the, of, of the of the value chains it's always been uh, the the risk and the um, the challenge for for developing countries but the higher the, the technological and capability thresholds uh, the, the greater the the barriers to entry to the the more um, uh, uh, attractive parts of the value chain um, it's more difficult to get in, and once you're in, the returns can be higher, and the, the power of, of, of lead firms um, can, can also be higher. Um, so you know, I think it, uh, it only underscores the importance of, uh, of, of upgrading um, to try to, to capture um, more of the, of the value add um, and, and to localize um, more of the value chains. Um, I'm sure Antonio can talk more about the the linking back and, and uh, linking up uh, argument uh, around that. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, before uh, Antonio uh, started speaking, I would like to read uh, two more questions that appear in the in the chat. Uh, the first one is from Pablo. Uh, he say. Um, all previous revolutions 
had an input perceived as cheap and accessible so that technology is a, a technology is effectively transversal transversal uh, in this case we are thinking about the information uh, is it so freely accessible and then we have a uh, two more questions uh, one from ignacio uh, he thanks to the presenters uh, i would like to add a, a query to the exhibitors in particular and uh, antonio and fiona uh, if they consider that technology catch-up strategies are not uh, difficult for developing countries uh, are not difficult for developing countries in a context of global value chains more concentrated in large technology companies and how much of this can be overcome uh, with mission-oriented policies. And uh, finally, we have a question from Mario. Uh, that, thanks for your presentation. Uh, are there any specific sectors where developing countries have some participation, like tourism and agriculture, that not having a transit to uh, digitalization will imply to lose their participation in the market in the near future? And uh, finally, if Veronica Robert could just please explain why your you describe sustainability sustainability as a flavor. So that, that's the question. Many questions. And uh, can I add you, something? Yes. Okay. Just a little uh, bit because of, of Pablo's question uh, in terms of all the previous revolution uh, and the, the input perceived as cheap and accessible. Uh, I, I think all the previous revolutions also. Uh, had a, a very central uh, a hegemonic power where uh, the, the, uh, the, these revolutions uh, were uh, initiated and, 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 and that element was very uh, perceivable. <laughs> and uh, in this, in this uh, opportunity, I, I, I think there is also a dispute be between two big powers uh, and, and uh, in, in terms of an input that we that it is not uh, 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 where uh, in it, it is not evident as cheap and, and uh, as cheap and accessible. The same I, I think that uh, the the hegemonic power uh, can uh, shape the new uh, paradigm uh, has the, the force the, the strength to, to shape the new paradigm. So. Uh, I think in, in that sense that uh, the same, uh, the, the, well, the, the question is if, the, if it's necessary uh, to, to take uh, uh, this in, into account, uh, the, this geopolitical dispute to, uh, to, to uh, comprehend uh, uh, fully this uh, new situation in terms of, of industrial paradigm. That's the question. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Antonio, uh, would you like to go? Veronica and I were in the background to try to see who is going after. Go, you, you go, you go. <laughs> so we, we, I agree that I'm going to be very brief because I already talked too much. And thanks for the question. I think they are all extremely uh, pertinent and relevant. Uh, I'm not sure we will give justice to them in a uh, in few minutes. But let me try just to say a few, few things. Um, um, let me start from the very last one, just because I, it's fresh in my mind. And while Dario was talking, I mean, it's it's still quite difficult to understand what is the concentration of power in the context of some of the, for example, production technologies we are talking about, right? In terms of the platform, it's relatively more simple because you you, know, you can identify who are the big gatekeepers in terms of the of data, in terms of structuring of the platform and competition policies trying to uh, catch up with this new form of business model and how it manifests itself in different places. But when you start with you know production technologies where I focus quite a lot of my attention on, like for example robots, uh, take the example of China. You were alluding to now more bipolar type of situation where there are other powers and so on. So yes, China is the first by all metrics of trade and uh, federation of robotics data the first user in both in terms of stock in use of robots and flow of new robots adopted. But when you look at the, at the disaggregated level, this is recognized in the document that uh, Veronica mentioned, the Made in China 2025 and future plans, it is clearly shown that actually they are still depending on lots of uh, imported technologies 
uh, for the most complex uh, um, components of the uh, automated uh, system. So in a sense, it's true that things are evolving, but concentration in very specific technologies still remain in few countries who have been exactly at the forefront of the previous revolution. I think the big difference with China, Vietnam, or Korea in the past, or Japan, even if you go back, you know, Veronica was referencing Rosenberg, if you think about first ideas around indigenous innovation and technological adoption can be found already in the agricultural sector when Japan was importing uh, Fordson model in the 1910s from the US and Russia was doing the same. And at the end of the Second World War, Japan was leader in production of small adapted uh, tractors for the agricultural sector and Russia was not able to actually produce their own uh, replacement um, uh, components and so on. So the story of getting technology from abroad uh, absorbing them, reinventing them, indigenous innovation is always part of any forms of learning process. And there is nothing wrong with that. I mean, if there is, was you know, more copying happening, we'd be extremely welcome. The problem is that copying is difficult <laughs> because exactly as we have been saying, you need to have some minimum threshold of capabilities to be able to copy and innovate at the margin on these functionalities. This is the big success of China in the last 10, 15 years has been exactly reverse engineering, changing functionalities, and creating products that are more competitive, competitive in the market. So from that point of view, I think we need to be, uh, uh, you know, practice a bit of pessimism uh, of the intellect and a bit of optimism of the will in the sense that there are spaces where by copying, by having companies deploying these technologies, you can have indigenous innovation in the country. Uh, and the specific technology, this going back to Lorenzo first question, uh, there are areas where even the platform are actually not always creating a problem, right? If you think about many of the cases we've been looking in South Africa, the fact that the platform can disrupt incumbent position in a country with high level of concentration uh, actually is a positive thing, right? Because new small firms can actually enter into sectors where otherwise would not be able to get access to the market. The problem becomes when you try to see what is the cost of that, right? If I'm a new uh, hotel is trying to get into the big market or selling products to European markets, let's say, and Amazon or other platform takes 30% or big chunk of, of the return, then that can kill the opportunity to actually use that technology to generate surplus and reinvest that surplus and so on. So I think it's a, it's, a complex, it's a complex situation and all of us have been emphasizing this heterogeneity. So I think we will all refrain, refrain from trying to give a, a uniform answer. Uh, I think with what we all have in common here, which is paradoxically not a very dominant narrative in international context, is the fact that this is not a, uh, a um, the digitalization is not about uh, how to avoid it, to industrialize. It's actually how to have a better, how to use the technology to do the industrialization, even in a better way, in a more inclusive way, in a more sustainable way, and so on. But it's not a way of uh, 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 skipping that fundamental process, which I think uh, it's not simply about generating material surplus, but it's about shaping the society, the institution, the state formation in a different way. And so this is why I think we, we, we cannot uh, forget that the new paradigm has something fundamentally deeply structurally linked to the old paradigms. There is, I think this is part of the more Marxist type of <laughs> Uh, inside of all this is this material transformation, whatever the technologies and the modes of productions and relationship are, remains core to understand uh, uh, these, these changes. I'll stop there. Otherwise, I um, can talk too much. Thank you, Antonio. Antonio uh, Vero, would you like to? Okay, I will add some, some, some things, but uh, Fiona and Antonio has already addressed most of the topics. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. They're very uh, interesting and, and very important, all of them. And uh, regarding, uh, I, I would like to say two, two things uh, regarding global value change and regarding the uh, cost of new technologies. And uh, 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 first, uh, regarding global value change, uh, I have been uh, visiting some uh, 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 some uh, industrial plant in automotive sector in the past few weeks 
And uh, what we saw there that is there are a lot of uh, new technologies that have been arrived to industrial uh, plants not more than five years ago. Uh, the robotiz robotization, which is uh, 3.0 uh, technologies, have arrived to industrial uh, automotive sector in Argentina around uh, 2013, 2012, no more than that. And uh, now there are, uh, we, we we uh, passed to have uh, no more than 20% of the welding uh, robot robotized in 2010. And now we have uh, almost 100% uh, of the welding robotized in just uh, five or eight years at most. And uh, of course, this uh, introduction of new technologies, which is now leading to digitalization, uh, is extremely linked with the uh, with the requirements of the of, of terminals uh, of automotive terminals uh, uh, and uh, the clients to to those automotive part industry. So global value change is promoting. Uh, very much the adoption of those technologies and it's not only a matter of uh, cost, it's not only a matter of uh, control, it's also a matter of quality, the quality uh, uh, needed to, to cope with the client's demands uh, will not be performed by by, by manual welding, for instance. So global value change will uh, for sure uh, uh, fostering the diffusion of those technologies. And uh, another issue that uh, we also have seen in those visiting is regarding to, to Pablo's uh, question uh, about cost. And when we were talking with uh, SMEs, uh, auto part producers, uh, what were the drivers to introduce uh, robots to their production lines? Uh, cost is, was, uh, was a, a major issue. The cost uh, has been reduced very much in the last years, so adoption is been possible uh, when 10 years ago, it, it doesn't. So uh, I think uh, this is, uh, uh, I, I think is, I, I agree with, uh, with you that uh, in this um, wave of technology, it's more expensive to introduce new technologies that, it, that was in the, in, the previous, uh, in the previous revolutions, but uh, I think we are witnessing uh, a cost reduction, which is not very, uh, not very quick, not very fast, but it's consistent and uh, it will be uh, going back and back. And uh, this is also a matter for SMEs that want to incorporate and want to adopt some of those technologies related to to foreign industrial revolution. For instance, uh, PLCs uh, from, uh, from Siemens or other global providers are very expensive for, um, for MSMEs in, for instance, plastic sectors in Argentina, but uh, there are uh, electronic industry in Argentina that design integrate circuits that are printed in China uh, that are specific for one task. They are not uh, programmable, but they are specific for one task and very, very, very uh, cheap. So they can adopt uh, solutions that are specific for one industry. And uh, we can do that because we have 
some electronic uh, capabilities in our uh, in our in our uh, industrial uh, structure. Uh, also, uh, uh, also software capabilities uh, that we have. And uh, answering Leonardo' specific question about sustainability flavor, I mean, uh, I mean uh, for that that uh, we have. Uh, for a long time, uh, a focus on innovation just on productivity issues and productivity matters. But now we are seeing different drivers for innovation and there are a lot of public support for, for, for instance, transformative uh, innovation policies that trying to, to cope with sustainability issues that perhaps are not uh, very matchable with uh, productivity uh, objectives. Perhaps there are less productivity than the, than, than others. But uh, uh, I think it's a it's a new element that we cannot uh, we cannot uh, forget. We when we see what uh, technology is aimed at. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, I don't know if uh, Fiona, Antonio, or Veronica have something to add before to close the session. Okay, uh, so uh, we close the session now. Thank you again, Fiona, Antonia, Veronica. It was a very nice session. And thank you all for joining. I hope we meet at other events soon. soon. So thank you very much. Uh, bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Thank so you much. very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye bye. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Bye.